Hello, everyone. If you are just now joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be Institutional Reform in the Age of Cryptography. I'd like to welcome Santiago to the stage to introduce our next panel. Hello, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to, to uh, inaugurate this panel on institutional reform in the age of cryptography. Um, certainly a very interesting topic. We have uh, three panelists that will be joining me today here. Um, why don't you guys introduce yourselves? I know you already very well, and I'm a big fan of your work, but uh, it's probably better for you to share what you want to share. And why are you here? Why are, why are, what, what do you want us to talk about as we talk about institutional reform in the age of cryptography? Why don't you go first, Kevin? Okay. Uh, so hi, everyone. I'm Kevin Iwaki. I am the founder of Gitcoin. Gitcoin is a place that you can get coins if uh, you're working on software development. Our mission is to grow and sustain open source software. So open source creates $400 billion per year of value in the world. And software developers like me who are working on it are just doing it as a donation. Software development turns out is this thing called a public good, something that's non-excludable and non-rivalrous, but that our world relies on. I'm breathing fresh air and drinking fresh water out here in Colorado, and I rely on our roads and bridges in order for the economy to run and for, for everything in, in, in my house and, and in my life that's material. So basically there's this question, um, as we move from the industrial age, how do we move to the information age and still support public goods? Because there isn't a business model for a lot of public goods, like there isn't a business model for open source. So that's what I'm working on at Gitcoin. We've created $500 million worth of payouts for open source software developers and are hoping to expand what we're doing to other public goods in the information age. Um, I guess I'll pass the mic over to Zargum. Go ahead, Zargum. Uh, I'm Michael Zargum. I'm the uh, founder of a private R&D research company called Block Science. Um, and I am a founder of the Common Stack project, which is focusing on enabling sort of new institutional patterns in the provision of public goods as a result of these sort of emerging technologies, including cryptography. Um, I think an important note for me is that I did my PhD work in decentralized dynamic resource allocation problems and actually worked on um, the kinds of infrastructure problems like power grids and flows and transportation networks, sort of hybrid behavioral system structures at large scales, and kind of got an insight into how that's managed maybe in the traditional, more physical uh, infrastructure space, and have seen the sort of uh, analogies, both sort of similarities and differences in the context of software-based public goods and have a pretty strong motivation to bring what I can from those existing sort of cyber physical systems domains into this sort of more socioeconomic systems regime. And in um, particular, I'm really excited to be here because lately I've been sort of taking that expertise into um, a more political economy realm, collaborating with the um, researchers at, at MetaGov who you've also heard from in this um, event. So happy to be here. Thank you very much and uh, pass it to Jason. Thanks. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Jason. I'm, uh, I'm the co-founder of a project called Wildcards. Um, I'm, uh, my background is largely in engineering, but um, Basically, ever since falling into the, the blockchain rabbit hole, I've been fascinated with all things governance and um, how these technologies can uh, influence our lives and make uh, future, uh, future organizations better than current organizations. So Wildcards is a fun and engaging platform for people to contribute to wildlife conservation. Um, and um, we do this via a new economic model that's actually quite relevant to, um, to the radical exchange. Uh, it was uh, first written about by um, Glenn Weil in his uh, 2018 book, um, and that's called Harbinger Tax. So that's one of the main mechanisms, but um, we experiment with lots of other things. And, and the idea really is to um, connect uh, organizations to people who care about the, the causes that those organizations are are fighting for uh, in a very transparent and open way um, and that's where my interest in in governance really started kicking off because uh, we've got um, 
all these partners and um, we've got funds flowing through the platform, but we need to actually manage that. So hopefully we can, we can talk about that more through this panel. Thanks. So as I was uh, reading my usual doses of uh, crypto Twitter this week, uh, there was suddenly a lot of enthusiasm around the idea of governance tokens. You know, there's this project Compound Finance that they launched their token, and it's uh, suddenly a conversation around, uh, well, maybe this might be the year of governance tokens. So it makes me wonder, what, what is the current state of the art on blockchain governance? You know, we are all very familiar with the fact that most of the, these systems are actually plutocratic, the only real influencers are the whales holding large amount of tokens. Um, can we actually turn the blockchain into a, a place for democratic systems of governance? And what are the, the roadblocks that we need we need to remove in order to get there? Um, I know you, Kevin. You know you are pretty concerned about the problem of addressing civil attacks on Gitcoin. Um, mm. So, what you've been looking into this field? Yeah, thanks for the call out, uh, Santi. So um, I think that uh, crossing a couple of, of, of topics here, governance tokens, and then how do we make these systems more democratic? Uh, Gitcoin is called Gitcoin because uh, it's a, gate, a place where you can get coins, but we don't actually have a token. So um, for, for about two years, I kind of like stuck my head in the ground and I didn't want to talk about token mechanics for a long time, but... Um, but uh, basically, I, I think that uh, we've taken a different route, which is to use the quadratic funding formula to democratically allocate public goods. And, um, and, and basically, the way that works is that uh, we'll multiply donations to different projects using a 200K matching pool. And we'll multiply it more based off of the number of contributors that we see to each grant as opposed to the amount that they contribute. So it optimizes for public goods that a broad swath of the community actually cares about. And um, the problem with that is that, uh, well, there's two problems with that. One is that there's this thing in human economic systems that's called the Matthew effect, which is the compounding effect of, of accumulated capital and accumulated gains, which just means it's like a fancy way of saying the rich get richer. So we're kind of like fighting against that. Like it's like entropy uh, with, with physical systems, human systems tend to capital uh, to consolidate. And so we're fighting against that, but we're also fighting against this thing called civil attacks. And the way that that works is that there's an economic incentive to make up a new identity so that you get more of the matching funds using the quadratic funding formula. And so basically I've been building up this anti-civil infrastructure where if you lie about who you are, then I, then I know about it. And it's kind of funny to put out these honey pots and to see these sophisticated and unsophisticated actors try to get the honey out of them and just to study their behavior. Um, I don't know anything about governance tokens, so I'll pass it over to the one of the more tokens-y people on the panel to talk about that. Cool. Hi. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll jump in. Wild, Wild Cards does actually have its, its own uh, young little token. So um, how wild cards works is we've got uh, non-fungible tokens uh, that represent um, animals, primarily endangered animals, and people become patrons of these animals, like guardians. And while you look after this animal, you basically um, streaming money um, over the internet to the organization wherever they are in the world. So that's kind of the high level. Um, and we we thought there would be an it would be nice to basically incorporate um, some kind of record of how long people have been holding these animals. So while you hold an animal um, at a rate of one per day, you get a, a loyalty token. Um, and it's quite interesting. As soon as you've got this thing, it's it's basically a single number that uh, you know each person has. That's really all all the token is. Um, you can start to build other things on top of that, like that, that abstraction. So, uh, you know, the, the first thing we've, we've built is, um, uh, a voting mechanism. Uh, so that uses quadratic voting. Um, and, uh, the anti-civil mechanism is the, the wild cards themselves. So to vote, you have to hold the wild card, and th th those are limited in in number. Of course, you know there's um, improvements we'll 
need to make in the future if people start trying to manipulate that. Um, but I would say, you know, uh, uh, to like uh, governance tokens, I think, will come in and out of favor as uh, waves of tokens that are more spammy or more um, speculative come in and others that, you know, really have a true sort of value in, in the system. Um, but I, I think, you know, the ability to take um, something that's very abstract and complex, like governing a system, and sort of reducing it into a single number uh, is really powerful. And that's what a, a token balance is. It's a single number per person. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else wants to add to that. I would actually. So, you know, important note about tokens in the role of governance is that they are actually more than, than just a single number in the sense that they relate to the rights and privileges that come with holding that token. So if you think of it a bit like um, sort of database management like roles and the rights that come with those roles. We've added some additional properties like you know explicit magnitude when the quantity of tokens matter or transferability that allows people to sell them to each other. But actually neither of those properties are required. I mean, in your example with an NFT, there was no magnitude, it was the absence or presence, but maybe you can get one through a financial means. Um, in some of my experience, we've, we've um, used other mechanisms. For example, in the common stack, the primary decision-making or advice process group is called the trusted seed, and the trusted seed is non-transferable, non meaning you, you can get it by participating um, in the community and doing things and essentially getting um, attributed this credit for those contributions, and that provides you inclusion in certain group discussions that inform decisions of the group as a whole. And I actually think that this is an important distinction because you know, a, a governance token does not have to be tradable for it to be a governance token. And in fact, one might argue that a plutocratic system, quote unquote, where the tokenization of the governance right isn't transferable is actually less plutocratic by its nature as long as it remains local to the participants or the contributors in that system. And I view this as being more of a path towards a hierarchy, one where there are many small groups with locally governed decision making and some overlapping people and some overlapping projects, but rather than looking at tokens as enabling us to buy and sell governance rights, they may just be an accounting, a very transparent accounting of the manner in which you acquired those rights and the manner in which you exercise them. And I've been a contributor to a project called SourceCred, which is a, an incredibly valuable project for providing transparency and contributions and is moving in the direction of um, some tokenization, though hasn't currently implemented anything. And I'm also um, a maintainer of an open source project called CADCAD that's been the beneficiary of many Gitcoin grants. And actually, I'm currently drafting governance documents for that organization. And as it turns out, it's never going to have a token, at least there's no plan for it now. But we do governance and plan to do governance using the GitHub infrastructure and just allowing certain people rights and roles based on their past contributions. And um, I recently deployed an instance of source cred for that project. And I'm in the process of tuning it as a way of sort of with the other maintainers making some decisions about, you know, who should get to participate and to what extent in the governance of that project. And I'm actually very excited, but I think it's important to recognize that tokens don't have to mean financial assets. They're really just cryptographically secured proofs of a right. And how we manage those rights is very much a traditional governance problem. Um, I'd like to mention that actually Jason and, and John John from Wildcards won the bounty we put on Gitcoin uh, from Democracy Earth uh, to develop a, a quadratic voting DAO. And the interesting idea uh, among the many ideas uh, that they, they put into the code is that, for instance, uh, all of those participants in the DAO, um, the funds that they contribute to the DAO, they are put directly on an interest generating tool like Aave. And uh, as long as they keep voting, uh, the interest generated from the, the pooled funds uh, will go to the voters. Uh, and I found that as a very interesting mechanism on how to actually use money as a tool for governance. Um, there are coming some questions from the audience. Makoto, for example, is asking about comp and the the, the why it looks like everyone is going crazy on farming right now. So 
what that what how does money play in 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 the interplay of governance and tokens and and you know how we can prevent uh, or do we want to prevent bribery or um, uh, all kinds of uh, attacks that could happen with the influence of money in these kinds of systems yeah i would i would say you know money is um is a sort of rep representation of of scarcity that um that simplifies things uh, simplifies things so you know the old the old story of um you know before money you know there were many different uh, mediums of exchange and and things that were being exchanged and it was just simpler to have um a unit uh, of of exchange and that's that's where money evolved so it's a very sort of natural thing and um i i don't think there's there's a, uh, any sort of need to fight against that um but of course you don't want it to to rule your system you don't you don't want um you don't want people not to participate because they uh don't feel they have any influence maybe because they're not financially um, as strong as others or um, you don't I think you know in these sort of systems um, what what the kind of goal is uh, with you know quadratic voting and all of these things is really you don't want uh, you don't want ever a situation where someone can put in less money than they get out by exploiting the system so you know, uh, with quadratic voting, it solves that problem. If I put in a large amount of money, my influence diminishes um, rapidly. So, you know, uh, with with these sort of um, protocols, I, I do think you do need that sort of scarcity to make it valuable and uh, having influence over something that's important to people, you know, is valuable. That's why people are building trying to build these systems on on blockchains and not you know sql databases just like people are using uh, blockchains for money so i actually see a lot of similarities between governance and money um but sometimes governance isn't fungible for like buying your groceries you know um and i guess the other part of it was uh you know how people are sort of going crazy over over the 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 comp tokens i'm not really an, an expert on that but i guess um it's it's really about finding a sort of balance the market needs to uh adjust to this new mechanism and um people are, are working out what the value of that token is and trying to work out its future value and that's uh, i mean pure speculation but um i think it's it's important to um that it goes through that phase to find its value, um, um, you know, going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, um, you know, what came up in my mind, Santi, when you asked that question about the relationship between governance and money is um, when I was first learning about Casper, uh, Casper and proof of stake as it as it pertains to Ethereum, I was listening to this podcast where Vitalik was talking about how important it was to build a cryptographic system that is easier to defend than to attack. And by easier, we mean cheaper to defend than to attack. And so one of the really re amazing reasons why public private key encryption is such a breakthrough for the internet is that it's so much easier to defend your, your personal information with public private key encryption, provided that you don't accidentally upload your keys to GitHub or something like that. Um, not that we know anyone who's ever done that. Uh, but basically, um, so the, the, the TLDR is that when you're building these systems, you want to make them much cheaper to defend than to attack. And so with the consensus mechanism for Ethereum, as we move to proof of stake, then um, it's really important that uh, that, that setup is, 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 is elegant and that the, the people who are staking are, are defending the system. But you can also apply this, this to other, other systems out there. And I think that whether you consider something to be an attack on a system really depends on the design of that system and what goals, what are the means, the governance tokens are just a means to an end of the goal of that system, right? So how do you define an attack on the system? Uh, just to use another example beyond the Ethereum consensus mechanism, one of the reasons why I view 
fake news and disinformation to be such a problem in today's society is that it's much easier to attack an information system by spreading a false rumor uh, than it is to defend it. You know, the the rumor goes a million miles before the truth gets an inch is I, some bastardization of the old saying. Um, so my goal with quadratic funding is explicitly to optimize for a broad group of participants and what they want and not what the whales want. And so the, the sort of algorithm is what governs that. But um, for me, someone making up a new identity and attacking quadratic funding is the attack vector. And I just need to make it easier for Gitcoin to attack, to defend that than it is, than it is to attack. And that's the principle that I bring to all these systems. To answer your question concisely, whether or not you're defending it or sorry, uh, attacking a system by buying too many of the governance tokens sort of depends on the design goals of that system and whether it needs to be democratic or uh, plutocratic in, in, in nature, which way it can work. I'd like to sort of tag, tag along the discussion about what, what makes something an attack in the context of governance tokens by sort of calling to mind the fact that the procedures that are being implemented in, um, in Gitcoin and, and really in any of these algorithmic um, policies making settings are actually um, procedural or, or automations of administration of, of processes and that there's always going to be a sort of incompleteness of that contract in the sense that there are going to be norms, what's acceptable behavior in the context of that system that extend beyond the, um, the code itself. And, and an example here would be um, in a blockchain system, say Ethereum, we're dealing with, say, automated market makers. We deal with uh, attacks of the form of front running, which are st strictly speaking, they follow the code, but they you could argue that they're attacks on the grounds they're actually violating the norms of the system and that we are saying like, we shouldn't just jump ahead of someone in line and exploit them because we actually want these to be information aggregating systems. So the purpose of something like quadratic voting and quadratic funding is to actually get signal out of the body of people who are participating in that system and certain categories of activity, which are potentially financially beneficial, whether they're civil attacks or you know, front running in automated market makers, et cetera, they sort of violate the implicit social contract associated with participating in that mechanism. And this reminds us that we don't have a system where we can completely reduce everything to code. And so while we should continue to use techniques to reduce the, um, reduce the friction of using the system as intended and increase the cost of friction or frictions for violating those norms, we actually also need to respect the fact that there are norms at play here, call them out, identify them, um, and make them part of our conversation around governance. And, and I actually think the Gitcoin examples um, are, are very good examples of that. We're getting some questions from the audience, which are very on point. Uh, Fanny is asking, uh, how do you think that we could make governance tokens work for larger communities who are not in blockchain? Um, and and you know you know as as global and public blockchains are going to affect, uh, you know how are going to impact and influence the very local community based governance? How we do this interplay between these global networks and the local governance? and um, how we can extend the reach of blockchain-based governance because right now everything is pretty much you know we're eating our own dog food and it's uh, crypto for crypto but eventually we need to understand how we can make the leap of whether we use this technology to influence uh, established governance like traditional governments or uh, uh, address societies the, the governance challenges of society at large uh, um, uh, how do you see that transition? You know, will, will blockchains displace nation states? Oh man, I am muted, so I just walked right into this one. Um, I, I just wanted to say that uh, we're taking quadratic funding to the mainstream, and we're going to be running an experiment with quadratic funding called downtownstimulus.com, and it'll be designed to support the public good of a livable, uh, pleasant downtown and we're going to be helping retail businesses use quadratic funding in order to uh, get stimulus money in, in the local community in Colorado. And I'm really pissed about how 98% of the stimulus money in the United States went to these big corporations. And I think that quadratic funding is a drop-in way to democratically allocate stimulus funds. So I don't know if blockchains are going to replace nation states, but I know that I'm going full speed ahead, full, full speed ahead in trying to get quadratic funding into the mainstream. 
I think that it's important to separate the idea of algorithmic policy and the technologies that make it possible to um, implement it in a trustworthy and scalable way from the, the policy making itself. So we're talking a lot about quadratic funding and, and sort of algorithms and their role in improving the um, scalability of you know, collecting and allocating funds in pursuit of public goods. But I think it's important to remember that the blockchain itself isn't really the nation state. If anything, it's a substitute for a certain category of bureaucracy and allows us to federate it and localize it more, which I think is a huge improvement. But I wouldn't necessarily think of, quote, the blockchain as the solution. It's actually that there's this sort of zeitgeist that, that Kevin is referring to that I think just everyone understands and insofar as we create tools and solutions and practicalize it, you know, regardless of which technologies are under the hood, we're making it more accessible and more realistic to do things in an interconnected, composable, but inherently federated way. Yeah, maybe maybe I'll, I'll you know, take that and actually go the opposites and, uh, and sort of maybe speak more about the technology. Um, I think uh, you know, as an as an engineer, I, I, you know, run into these problems. You know, is it going to be scalable enough? Is it user friendly enough? Uh, what are the sort of attacks that, um, from a technical level, that that you need to protect against? Um, and I think there's really a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, as for how it'll sort of go more mainstream, um, that you know, that's a good question. Whether uh, sort of big corporations and governments will start adopting it or whether it'll be very grassroots, uh, you know, you know, wild cards, for example, starts to grow rapidly. And, um, you know, we've got an amazing UI and UX and, uh, you know, it's so smooth, people don't even know it's on a blockchain. And, you know, maybe that's the other route. And I mean, that's obviously, uh, from my perspective, what I'm aiming for with, with wild cards, the, um, it was actually Griff, uh, I think, a week or two ago, who um, who voted in our in our DAO, in our DAO, um, and you know pointed out, you know, that he spent um, I think a dollar or two dollars. The gas high, the gas prices were super high, uh, and I think the payout to the organization that month was uh, you know like forty dollars or something. So it isn't even that much money, and you know these kind of kinds of systems to scale really need to um, be so smooth that um, it doesn't take an expert like Griff who's been working in the industry so long and uh, even even Griff he ran into those problems of the the price and um, and all of that so I think you know it may, maybe maybe talking about the reddit tokens I think uh, you know, if that moves forward, um, so for those who don't know, uh, Reddit recently launched an experiment in two of their subreddits. Um, it's the Fortnite Reddit, the game Fortnite, and the cryptocurrency subreddit. Um, and, you know, these, these are maybe tokens that can play a role in sort of governing those subreddits you know you've got a large group of people who are very passionate about the topic and they get uh um like they get these tokens for participating sort of well in this uh community and i would say you know there's may maybe another path where this can sort of go mainstream but yeah sadly today i can't really say there are many DAOs that have uh, much participation at all. Um, people say this is the year of the DAO, but I I don't know if that's true. <laughs> I'm still waiting. <laughs> Size matters a lot. I've been participating in a bunch of very small DAOs that are very active, but that comes to the question of, of scalability. And, and I would say on the other end extreme, um, in not so much in the governance role, I, I've had the pleasure of collaborating with Will Ruddock at Grassroots Economics, who's released a, a community inclusion currency in Kenya and has had quite a bit of adoption, but the vast majority of the users have little or no knowledge of the crypto technology under the hood. And the scalability is really a large 
uh, factor, they, they've used a proof of authority chain. And so they're not running on a, on a primary sort of, you know, Ethereum scale blockchain where they have to deal with the, the costs. And there's definitely a lot of open questions around um, governance and open questions around, you know, actually meeting the needs of the stakeholder group, which is largely agnostic to the system. But I think it's important to bring that back to the discussion of public goods and infrastructure in previous ages, where to be very clear, very few people think a lot about the public infrastructure they use, their power grids, their transportation networks, et cetera. And so we, from a governance perspective, we can't just assume that everyone is going to participate. We have to also understand what kind of systems we put in place to allow for certain levels of complexity to get abstracted away from end users, but not exploiting them, but rather sort of using the engineering world as, as an example, you have a, a, a literal professional institution in place whose job is to safeguard the public good. And there's a sort of tension currently between the way the governments regulate those particular professional industries and how those prof professional industries regulate the sort of actual you know, buildings, like sign offs by engineers, et cetera. And so this is a mixture of liabilities and rights associated with the responsibility for deploying, managing, and maintaining critical public infrastructure at scale. And I don't think we talk about that enough yet in crypto. We still try to, we strive for this massive inclusion and this scalable governance. And sometimes we, we need to ask like, who should make which decisions under what circumstances, but also who are they beholden to? So we want all of these systems to be beholden to their constituents, but we don't necessarily want to ask constituents to be experts in the direct regulation of those who monitor and maintain that infrastructure. And so there's a lot of complexity to be worked out, but I consider that to be a question emerging political and part of the reason why it's important to be having these discussions and exploring basis. There's a, a question on, on the issue of complexity. Makoto is asking again from the audience uh, to Kevin, you know, uh, do you expect mom and pop shops to easily understand quadratic voting? Uh, as, I'm, as someone myself, I find myself explaining QV almost on a weekly basis in some place new to students, to people, and it's still not easy to get the whole idea in one sentence. So what's, have you been already talking to the folks in downtown Colorado to, to see if they grasp the concept? Yeah. Um, really great question. Um, we are gonna use Stripe as our payment provider. And I don't think I'm gonna put anything about quadratic funding on the site. Uh, I think that people who are not technologists will see the word quadratic funding and they're gonna worry that it's gonna steal their money. Um, and I mean, with all due respect to people who are not technologists, it's, it's a lot to handle. I can't, yeah. when I talk about quadratic funding, I can't say less than three sentences and I can't go more than six sentences before my wife rolls her eyes at me. Um, and so in a lot of ways, like, um, I'm not the client facing person on this downtown stimulus project. I've got this really amazing researcher that knows how to translate what I'm talking about into, um, something that a non-technologist will understand. Um, and I think that like, you know, one of one of my uh, people don't understand the word quadratic funding, but they understand putting together a matching fund um, from people who are in their community they respect. We um, have a commitment from a very respected philanthropist out here in Boulder, Colorado, and they understand that the matching mechanism optimizes for the number of donations, not the size of the donations, which you know makes sense. It's more democratic, um, and and it and it sort of creates hope for them that uh, even if they don't have rich patrons, if they have a lot of patrons, if they're a hub of the community, that they can, that they can um, make it work with quadratic funding. But I really think that the main thing that we're gonna need to do with this pilot is create one to three people who are really glowing about it. And we're gonna have to use the data from that to increase the matching round sizes, increase our credibil credibility, <clears throat> and then franchise, franchise across the country if we're successful. And it's all about that social proof and it's it's not about the sort of like intellectual purity of of quadra, quadratic funding with with that group. It's about the ease of use and and how practically useful it is. I, I'd maybe say something quickly. I mean, I I recently did um, some some funding on on Gitcoin, and uh, you know, it's obviously it helps if you know what the 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 principle is. But really, you you put in mm -hmm. a number of how much you want to donate, and it tells yeah. you 
an approximation of the match. So, you know, you can kind of go there and and see, oh, if I give this much, they get that much. Uh, yeah. You don't have to know the whole maths formula or, or anything. It kind of uh, just helps if there's uh, sort of feedback yeah. to the user. And I, I think there's a lot of things in, in society that um, are extremely complicated below the surface, but people just use them. Um, so just, just if you don't mind me interjecting really please. quick, um, this, this was actually one of the things that we were really focused on designing for the downtown stimulus thing. So basically like a dragger where you can see how much your donation will increase uh, as you drag it back and forth. And this hides a lot of math and a lot of science underneath of the user experience. Um, and, and um, you know, it, we introduced that, that estimate, get, contribute one die and get a hundred die back in the, to the UI around round three. And we five X our contributions from round two to wrap round three, because even cypherpunks don't want to have to do the math of how quadratic funding works. So I think that more UI elements that hide the complexity is, is sort of what I would recommend here. I also wanna make a very, I think hopefully complimentary point about the design of, of algorithmic policies, especially where money is involved. And it's that the properties are what matters and the UI elements help people experience the properties without understanding them. I see um, a lot of cargo cult math in crypto, like really like, it's it's hard to express how much there is. I'm sure many of you guys know. And in, in fact, you know, there's this tricky thing where the math matters a lot, but it only matters in so far as it exhibits certain properties. And so Kevin summarizes quadratic voting in terms of the property it has. Now, not every equation that someone says has that property has that property. So there's two elements, right? One is the extent to which your algorithm has actually has the property, which is a math thing that you can then abstract away. And the other is the extent to which you engage with people at the level of the properties, not with the, at the level of what mm -hmm. the equations themselves are. Which uh, you know, reminds me of uh, a classic book by now. It's an old book called Codes 2.0 by Lawrence Lessig. And uh, he's, he, he mentioned there that there's only four realms in, in, re in the world we live in that can be coded in one way or another. Um, and he referred to the law. The law can be coded. Um, markets can be coded. Norms and architecture. All those th four things are basically the realm where code lives. And uh, we have a question from the audience uh, around this concept from Divya. And, and it's, you know, how do we look or, or encode the differences between inbuilt rules, formalized code, and implicit norms? How, how you know the culture, how the users behave, to what extent uh, can norms be enforced in, in cryptographic systems? I don't want to eat up the air, so if somebody wants to say something, I'll wait. But I, I have some thoughts. Go ahead, Zargam. So I think the the most important aspect about norms is that 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 although they can be um, codified in a sense, um, when you compare them to like procedures that have been automated, the norms provide the sort of um, the sort of social or human expectations or the slightly less formal part of the uh, social arrangement or the contract or the interaction. And so I think it's less about codifying them in the sense that you put them into code also and more about building sort of transparency and expectation setting within a community and that provides a level of symmetry breaking not unlike the economic um, sort of balance of power we discussed earlier in a sort of social or reputational level where when it becomes clear when someone has violated a norm then it doesn't necessarily have to be enforced by code that they follow it because you know at that point it's kind of stepped beyond the realm of norms and i i want to sort of highlight the gap between normative and sort of truly enforced or something that's been made objective um because we need both together in order to make these sort of healthy systems yeah um i've got a little follow-on and i hope you guys don't mind if i share my screen. Um, this is from my talk that I gave at RxC last night. And basically, this is the way I've started visualizing the answer to this question. So we've basically got like human society, which has its goals. Um, and the goals are pl pluralistic. 
but what are the constraints on human society that um, we can either break or that are immutable or are not immutable? And so um, as we go up the stack from mathematics to physics, to the power structures of our world, to law, to finance, to media and culture, we're going from immutable things up to more mutable things, right? And so if you look at the stack of human society that we've inherited from the boomers and the parallel one that we're building in the information age, um, I like to think that quadratic funding really uh, does a really good job of interfacing with culture, media, and finance, and to some extent law, to the extent that we've used smart contracts as, as uh, international law. But, you know, I don't, I don't want to like summon the ghost of Vlad Zamfir here. I think that, uh, you know, there's a debate about whether or not that's true. So if you think about the stack that we're building, um, I like to think that we're building a more open source, more democratic version of this stack for law, finance, media, and culture in the radical exchange movement and in the blockchain movement. And Gitcoin just happens to specialize in making shiny objects that will grab attention from a culture and media perspective, and then providing an interface through which we can orient ourselves better um, and, and contribute to each other's projects through the, the Ethereum network. And so um, I guess the TLDR of what I'm saying is that uh, as you go from more immutable to less immutable, there is more experimentation that you can do and you can kind of mix these things together in order to create crypto economic systems. So it's it's not mutually exclusive. It's culture and law and, and the immutable data structures. Yeah, and I, I mean, uh, sort of thinking through building various uh, mechanisms with uh, with my friends and and, and co-founders, um, you know, it, it's kind of crazy the ideas that are sort of possible to you because code is very expressive. And um, I think um, often at, after going down a big rabbit hole, uh, at the end of it, we decide actually let's do the most simple thing and that that firstly makes it easier to write the code uh less prone to yeah. um various bugs uh less likely that there's some weird emergent edge case that happens in the real world because yeah. of it um so i i mean i think you know even let's say let's take the erc20 uh, for example um i mean it's beautiful because it's really quite simple there's not much to it and there's um all of these new sort of token standards um um that are emerging you know um what's the the one it's 1155 erc yeah um where it's like a mix of uh, non-fungible tokens and it can have multiple uh fungible tokens and you can trade them in the same smart contract and it's all super cool, uh, but I, I really think there's a lot of value in building very, very simple base building blocks um, and let sort of society yeah. go on, on top. I, I I'm think reminded I... of, um, oh, I was just gonna really quickly interject, like the key innovation I think of Moloch DAO was not overcomplicating a DAO. Like they just put rage quit and voting in there and that was pretty much it, which I, the simplicity was bliss there. Go ahead, Zargam. Yeah, so, so I think there's a really important concept here, which I usually refer to as hard fought simplicity, because we often look at these simple things with a sort of hindsight and which provides a sort of selection bias for the things that worked out, because there's a very strong tendency for simple things to work, but there's also a very strong tensity, tendency to think that because it's simple, it will work. And what we actually need to do is make the long path from many simple ideas to really kind of let things work themselves out, find out which ones are the ones that work and build on them and use them. And I generally use this term hard fought simplicity. And I think that Moloch Dow's structure in the rage quit is a good example. The ERST 20 is a good example. I think quadratic funding is a good example. Um, you know, in my own work, I, I've leveraged similar principles, but starting from the properties that I want, maybe the ones that we need or we're hoping to achieve, and you fight through maybe the more complex designs and work your way around back to the simplest thing that fulfills the goal or the need that you want. But it's not the same as saying that just because something is simple that it will work. This kind of yeah. reminds me of the Linux philosophy, uh, just like basically a bunch of small utilities that do one thing well, and then you can chain them together. Like I've written bash scripts that will chain like seven things together. And I think it's super powerful. Goes, that goes even back to Unix. <laughs> yeah, true that. 
And it, it's uh, a basic principle of systems engineering. I know a lot of people who have you know experience in different expert systems domains find that this axiom comes back time and time again. And I think that we're like learning it anew in the in crypto, especially since we're trying to focus on composability. Like composability really relies on modularity and of the sort of robust yet simple things with strong properties. It's uh, on Molokdao, that, that's the one thing that really made me really, really like the project, the simplicity, the fact that they aimed to do the shortest possible smart contract, only 400 lines of code, simplicity, you know, finding the, the right game theoretic tweaks to keep the risk of participating low, while at the same time making the incentives for the participants to remain cohesive. Um, and it has been a relative success. In, you know, there's now over a hundred Moloch DAOs deployed in the last year. Um, and especially when you look at the gas costs of uh, interacting with Ethereum, especially in these last weeks, uh, also the efficiency and the simplicity has an economic benefit on the interactions you have with the blockchain itself. Um, we are five minutes uh, from, from ending this, this incredible panel. We have a question from the audience, uh, from James, asking you know, some pragmatic, more pragmatic uh, ideas. What are some potential key management solutions for individuals that are not as tech savvy to participate in blockchain-based DAOs? What, what, what tools or what interesting stuff have you guys seen recently that will allow people to interact with these ideas easier or, or better, with better I, use? I I really like what Taurus is doing. They're basically taking the entropy that's provided by the OAuth providers of like Google and Facebook, and then taking a uh, making a private key off of that, and then um, using distributed key management systems to store it on a in distributed places. And it's kind of like Shamir's secret sharing algorithm, except it's the shards are automatically shared on the block um, on, on, on different nodes. And so it's just a one Java, like one JavaScript library that you can drop into your app. And then based off of an OAuth with Google, which is something that a user's already experienced with, you can have a private key, um, without installing MetaMask, without having to back up your seed phrase. And it's, uh, non-custodial for the DAP that's integrating it, which I think is the amazing thing. What's the name of the tool again? Sorry, I missed that. It's called Taurus, uh, Taurus Labs. I think they're a multi-coin investment. All right. I'm a particular fan of hardware-based solutions. I know they're a little bit farther off, but in fact, you know, even things like having a, a DAP node, or, or I guess they're going by Avado now, um, like these kinds of solutions where your um, your keys are actually just attached to a physical object that has um, the power to interact, and in fact, those are duplicable. Like you can imagine releasing them in bundles and. Um, having those share keys and there's a lot of strategies that could be deployed um, for making key management and key recovery feasible um, using hardware and again like kind of with an engineering background having worked in robotics like it's not that uncommon for you to have plug and play hardware that does sophisticated software stuff that you want to abstract away from an end user so I would actually like to see uh, more hardware centric solutions potentially integrated with chips that go cell phones or other types of solutions that actually take power of that um, the key management in the hands of the person but abstract it away um, through hardware very quickly i know there's very, very little time i'll i'll round it out and say um i'm very sort of uh, bullish on on uh smart contract wallets i think uh, the two that stand out are ethereum and um uh, Argent, uh, I think they they great because you can have a very configurable sort of security of of, of those smart contract wallets. You can have um, various ways to access them, for example, or various ways to recover them, um, and you can you can really um, aggregate lots of complex uh, interaction with the blockchain into something uh, that's simple from the outside. Um, and then I, I think the other sort of thing that's very important for making it easy for people to start interacting with these systems is, um, you know, just access, um, fiat on ramps or just uh, basic access. I think most blockchains are terrible at this. You have to be in or you have to have gone through Coinbase or whatever. Um, and then, yeah, maybe, maybe the last thing I think 
a lot more projects need to be happy to use less secure sort of side chains or um, things like that. I think, uh, you know, with wildcards for things that aren't important and when we uh, when we're dealing with, you know, like a hundred dollars worth of value, you know, we don't need to have the security of Ethereum um, if a lot of that logic can take place on a side chain like um, uh, the XDAI chain or something like that. So I think all of those coming together um, will hopefully make it slightly easier for new users. All right, guys, it's, um, it's been a, a real pleasure to have this conversation with you, to have a little bit of the experience of crypto Twitter on this uh, panel format at uh, RxC. Um, if there's definitely a lot of challenges as we face, as the relevance of these networks grows, especially in this new decade that is barely beginning and, and we're all building systems of governance that hopefully will um, take uh, more responsibility and more uh, face more challenges as these networks evolve and mature. It's been a real pleasure. Um, and uh, I guess we'll continue the conversation on crypto Twitter. Hi, Santi. Thanks for moderating. <laughs>